Great. Well, if you were here last week, I think I told you that this week we were going to be talking about prayer, but we are not going to be talking about prayer. So, um, I know, shocking. I'm not, I didn't intentionally lie, but because there was some graphic vandalism that happened at Blue Valley High on Monday... We're going to shift gears and talk about something a little bit different. So I'm actually going to tell you a story about seventh grade Megan. Megan is me. Me when I was in seventh grade. So when I was in seventh grade, probably much like any seventh grader, I loved hanging out with friends. I had lots of activities that I was involved in, but dance was my thing. I went to dance a lot, and that was the thing that I did the most that I spent the most time with. So you all have a hobby or an extracurricular that you probably had when you were in seventh grade, and that was your thing. I was also in band. I played the flute, and I was in choir, and I did all kinds of things, but dance was my thing. And I loved being with friends. I loved going to church. And I knew at that time in my life, like I just felt safe, right? I had stuff in my life that was difficult. Like you always have issues with friends at some point. But overall, I had just like a feeling of safety in my life. I would go to school and I felt safe. I felt safe at home. Just overall, a trending theme for seventh grade Megan is that I felt safe. I felt safe, though, especially at school. I had friends. My teachers were okay. Like, I didn't love school, but it was a place where I knew that it was safe. So in the spring of that year, in the spring of my seventh grade year, this was like January or February, there was a student in my grade who wrote a hit list of 10 names on the bathroom stall. And the date was like a week or two weeks away. Like they wrote the 10 names. They wrote that it was a hit list. I don't remember all the things that they wrote, but it was not great. Um, and so that was the first time that I actually really remember being scared to go to school. So when this happened, it was not too long after 9-11 had happened. So 9-11 happened in that September, and this was January, February, March, April. It was April time, and it was three years after a pretty high-profile school shooting, Columbine. So people were freaking out, and teachers were scared, administrators were scared, and we, as students, were really scared. It was just chaos in our school when that hit list was found and more information started coming out about it. So all of a sudden, a place that had felt really safe to me, that I knew I could walk in and have teachers who cared about me and friends and people that that I knew like that it was a safe place that all of a sudden just didn't feel safe anymore. Now, it wasn't a student who found the hit list of names, which was super great, because we actually never knew who was on that list. A teacher found it, and the bathroom got closed off really, really quickly, and nobody ever saw who was on that list of names. We have an idea of who wrote it because there were three students who got expelled after that. But we didn't get a lot of information. So for two weeks after that, we entered the building through metal detectors. There were undercover FBI agents that walked around our school. And it took every morning almost two and a half hours to physically get into the building because we were waiting in these really long lines to get through the metal detectors and then have them search our bags to make sure that this person who'd written this hit list was not going to act on it. So like I said, we had undercover FBI walking through the school at all hours that students were in the building. And on that day of the incident, I remember that's what they kept calling it, the incident, was supposed to happen, hardly anyone went to school, as you can imagine, except 
My parents made me go to school. They said, Megan, this is going to be the safest day of the whole year. The, uh, the FBI agents are there. The police are there. You have metal detectors. You have to go to school. You have to learn. Your job is to learn. Has anyone had their parents tell you that? Like, your job is learning right now. And I was like, I don't feel like today my job is learning. I'd like to stay home, please. So that day, there were four of us in seventh grade. We had like 320 students in our seventh grade class, and there were four of us. Uh, there were only substitute teachers, and they just condensed us all into one class. So like we had, between the two seventh grade classes, probably 14 teachers, and there were like two that were with us for the whole day, because who wants to go to school on that day. It's just kind of terrifying. And so we were there for the whole day. We watched movies and ate popcorn and just pretended like everything was normal and nothing was happening. And it was terrifying that whole day. Whole day. Ultimately, nothing happened. It was words that were written on the wall. We don't know exactly what the words said. We don't know what the names were. But it created fear. And all of a sudden, this place that was safe was no longer safe. In my life, I have had the privilege where most places I walk into are safe places. I don't have to be worried if I am going to be welcomed because of something about me. I am cisgendered and hetero and white female Christian. Like, I am like the basic white girl. So I'm going to be welcomed pretty much anywhere I go. And all of a sudden, my safe space wasn't safe. But for a lot of people in our world and a lot of people in our community, the places that we might think are safe are not safe for some of the people who are in our lives. If there was hate speech written on a wall somewhere, it's probably not going to be directed at me. It's a privilege that I have that not everyone has and a privilege that many of you have as well. So when hate speech comes up, when it's written on walls, when it says, when it's said, it matters. Even if it doesn't seem like it matters to you or it doesn't impact you directly, it matters and it has an impact. Because for many of our friends and our neighbors and people in our community, there are going to be people who walk into spaces where they're not sure if they're welcomed and they're not sure if they're safe, whether it's because of their skin or their gender identity, their sexual orientation or their religious belief. I cannot begin to imagine what it would be like to go to somewhere every day, especially a place like school that's supposed to be safe and be unsure if I'm actually going to be safe because of something about who I am. But what I know is that when I knew that school was unsafe, I felt physically sick. I did not want to go to school. I was nauseous. I begged to stay home. And I can't imagine having to do that every day. James is who we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. And in the book of James, which is one of my all-time favorite books, it talks about the power of our words. And James, we believe to be the brother of Jesus, and he was directly influenced by Jesus. And in his teachings, he is encouraging people who are reading it to be wise and to live the way that Jesus calls us to live. So he talks a lot about three things, how we treat people, how we practice our faith, and how we use our words. And while all of those are really important, what I want to talk about tonight is our words, because they are really powerful. So when he's talking about words, he's actually talking about how dangerous our words can be, and we know that. We know that our words can be really dangerous and that our words can be really hurtful, and if we put them on a wall or in a stadium or we just say them, 
that they can cause great harm to people. So he talks about how the tongue is like a rudder of a boat, which is a small part of the boat that can direct where the boat goes. It has enormous impact, this tiny little thing. And so he goes on to talk about how our words are like small sparks that can set forest fires ablaze and they can spread and encourages us to use our words carefully and thoughtfully because our words have the power to build people up and tear people down. And you know that because you have probably had people use their words to tear you down or build you up before. And maybe you have used your words that way as well. So James goes on to say this, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So he's telling us that our words can be harmful, and from the same mouth, we can stand here and sing praises to God and also say really hurtful things to people. And he's challenging us to be careful with what we say and how we say it. And I also want you to think about that scripture, right? He says that our words can set a fire ablaze, just a little spark, that our words can be destructive and harmful, But what if our words, our positive words, and our ability to stand up for other people and care for other people and show up for other people are just as powerful as that? What if our words that are standing up for someone and encouraging them and building them up set a spark that sets a forest on fire to start a movement that is something really, really powerful? Dangerous and hurtful words have the power to impact people, but our words that are kind and stand for justice and that are speaking up and caring for others have just as much possibility to impact people. How are you using your words? Are you using them to tear someone down, to make someone feel small so that you can feel really big? Or are you using them to lift other people up, to encourage them, to inspire them? When my school all of a sudden became unsafe, there was a lot of work that the district did to make sure that we felt safe. But for me, it wasn't the FBI, the undercover cops, the metal detectors. Those weren't things that made me feel safe. They helped, they're fine, they're good tools. But it was the community around me that made me feel safe again. It was the people I knew. It was our friends and the people in our grade who banded together to help us feel safe because it changed the dynamic of our school. People became kinder. When kids were mean to each other, people started standing up for each other who hadn't done that before. We showed up for each other with our words and our actions in a way that we hadn't before because all of a sudden we realized that those same people could have been the ones that were threatened on that list. And no matter what you think about someone else, you don't want them to get shot in a school. That's just really tragic. So people started using their voices and they started speaking out. And when people were worried about other people because they thought there was something that, was, that they were struggling with, they just started standing up for them. They would share with their teachers and try to get their friends help. We weren't all best friends, but we worked together to make it safe. And it wasn't something we tried to do. It's just something that, that happened where we started working hard together to try to make our school feel safe again. And I wonder what it would look like for you to do that in your school. How you would use your words to make your school safe again. How can you use your voice to stand up for others and show them love and care? If you see hurt in your school, and even if you don't, It exists in your school. 
Is there something that you can do about it? Is there something that you can say about it? If your group of friends is speaking negatively about someone, are you able to tell them to stop? Or do you let them keep going and stay silent? Because silence is just as powerful. And sometimes we just let those things happen. If your sports team or dance group or whatever hobby you're in is excluding someone because of who they are, are you saying something? Or are you staying silent? And saying something can be really hard. It can be really scary to stand up to especially our friends who might be saying something hurtful. If you hear something harmful that's going to happen, do you catch yourself thinking, yeah, that's not really a big deal. It doesn't impact me. Or are you thinking, wow, they put something out there that was really hurtful. I might need to check in on this friend. I might need to reach out to them to see if they're okay. Our words have power, and our actions have power, and what we do with them has influence over the people around us. So what I want you to think about is how are you using your influence? How are you using your words? And in your groups tonight, you're going to talk about how hard that can be, how hard it can be to use your words and how hard it can be to stand up to people that you love, that you're close to, who are not being kind and inclusive of all the people in our lives. Let's take a minute to pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are, God, and I thank you that you created each one of us uniquely with purpose and on purpose. God, and I ask that you help us to recognize that even the people that we struggle to love, that you created them with purpose and on purpose as well, and that you would help us to know them better and to love them better, God, and that as we see injustices around us, that you would help us to use our voice and to use our influence to make a positive impact on the world around us. Amen. Go ahead and stand up. We're going to worship a little bit more.